Hey folks, thanks for joining and we have Anthony Lewis here today to talk about Horary Astrology and I've been meaning to have Anthony Lewis uh, for, for quite some time and uh, today it's uh, we are here to talk about Horary Astrology, Western Horary Astrology and uh, Anthony has been doing astrology, I think he just mentioned it like since 11 years old. So it's it's a long time and uh, it's a it's a great experience. You have you would have had some great experiences uh, with astrology, but I think that's for a different time. So we'll just uh, jump into horary astrology. And I've been fascinated with uh, the studies of horary astrology ever since I started reading William Ely's work and John Foley's work is also one of the most important works when it comes to horary astrology. So, thank you so much for joining me and I'm sure this session is going to be fun. Okay, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I've been following your work online and enjoying it. Thank you. So, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you in person, or sort of in person. Yeah, virtually. <laughs> person online, a virtual person. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you asked me to say a little about the history of horary. And I want to begin by saying that I'm not an expert historian, so this is my understanding from my reading. I also did Chris Brennan's course on Hellenistic astrology and horary, and he talks some about the history. So uh, some of what I know comes from his course, and I've also read a lot about the history, but this is what I understand. Um, in the West, horary goes back a couple thousand years uh, to Hellenistic times. The Greece, Egypt, that whole uh, area around Alexandria, Egypt, where astrology really flourished and began the way we know it in the West. I know that India has a long tradition of horary, but I know much less about Indian astrology, Vedic astrology. Uh, I think David Pingree, who's one of the great historians of astrology, believed that horary in India at least went back to the maybe second or first century. Mm -hmm. So again, 2,000 years. And that in India, you have, I guess, some classic texts from the 16th century by, um, is it Nilakanta? Yeah. Uh, but I really haven't studied the Vedic version of Horary, so I, I can't say much about it. You probably know a lot more. I'm sure you know a lot more than I do. Uh, and that's on, that's on my list to do in the next few years, to go through and try to understand the Vedic approach. But anyway, in the West, uh, I think the current theory and the literature is the first references to anything like horror go back to probably Dorotheus, who was probably second century, uh, and a guy named Hephaestio. Hephaestio of Thebes. Of Thebes. He had some work. And it seems to me that what happened historically is that astrology, at least in Western astrology, the, the basic principles began in Mesopotamia, Babylonia, and they were the ideas were brought to Greece and Egypt when Alexander the Great conquered that region. Mm -hmm. And then Astrologers began using the horoscope, the ascendant, and doing natal charts. Prior to that, it was more mundane astrology. The Babylonians were looking at the skies, cataloging events, celestial events, on clay tablets, and seeing patterns, and were eventually able to predict the reoccurrences of celestial phenomena, you know, like eclipses were very important. And knowing that they could predict when the planets or the sun and moon would align in certain ways, they began, they began predicting events like affecting the nation, mundane astrology. Uh, I think it was more the Hellenistic astrologers who started doing consultations with individuals. So you would go see an astrologer and they, if you had your birth information, they would look at your birth chart. I think that often people didn't have their birth information. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you were from a wealthy family, it might not have been recorded or you might not know. Uh, 
And so astrologers had this dilemma, like what do you do with a client if you don't have a birth chart? And they began looking at what are called consultation charts, hmm. meaning the time the person comes to see you, you do a chart for. And then based on that, you try to deduce why is this person here? What is concerning them based on the moment that they came to visit you? Sure. And I think that was the earliest form. It wasn't called horary then. I think the Greek word is katarche. Katarche, yeah. Katarche, meaning the beginning or inception of something. And the katarche could refer to electional charts. Like if I want to, you know, build a building or go on a journey, what's the best time to start the journey? Uh, but the idea was also if there was an event, you could look at the chart for the beginning of the event and see how the chart developed over time to get a sense of how the event would develop. And I think, in, in, I think it's Dorotheus gives an example of this. Uh, and I may be not remembering this 100% correctly, but I believe in Dorotheus, he discusses a, a man came to see him with a question, my slave ran away, where did he go? <laughs> oh. uh, and Dorotheus discusses this, well, there's three possible charts you can use. If you know exactly when the slave ran away, you can use that chart, it's an event. Oh but maybe you don't know exactly when the slave went, ran away, but you might know when the person, one of your employees informed you that the slave ran away. So when you learned the news of the event and you could use that chart to see where the slave went. And if you didn't know that, the last possibility was you could use the moment the client came and asked the astrologer, the person, yeah. where did my slave go? And they thought that chart was also meaningful and could produce an answer if you followed it out. So there's three possible charts. The first one is clearly an event. You know, something happens, you time it exactly, you look at the chart. The second is news of the event. And the third is, I don't know any of that, but you're the astrologer, tell me where my slave is. And yeah. so that becomes then an interaction between a client and an astrologer. And the two of them decide at that moment, we're going to look at the heavens to see what the heavens can tell us about this matter. There are two other things that John Frawley brings to add to this. Like, uh, he, he says that he brings out a very practical problem here. Like, in those days, uh, astrologers needed to be uh, I mean, they need to meet their clients in person and that was how it was happening. So, uh, and the other thing is that uh, today we have a lot of technological impro improvements and I just can call an astrologer and post a question and he can just write it down and he can keep it and he can, he can just see it after two hours or three hours. So mm -hmm. again, there is a lot of confusions in terms of which time to, we have to precisely stick to. So it's, it's basically, uh, uh, I think John mentions that uh, it is it is exactly that time when we read the question and understand the question and we try to uh, interpret the result of an event. So well, yeah, it depends on your theory of astrology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I think there, I divide in two broad classes of theories. One is the scientific astrology. Astrology is a science, it's cause and effect. And if you know the cause, you can figure out the effect, like physics. Yeah. And I think the other approach is more divination. Divination. Astrology is consulting with the heavens and trying to get some divine wisdom about what concerns you. And th this, I think, is the approach of um, Jeffrey Cornelius. Who, uh, do you know his book? He wrote a brilliant moment, book. Called yeah, Moment of Astrology. So one, it's a, one of my very favorite all-time books on astrology. And I, I really fall into that camp. I agree with him that I think what we're doing with horror is divination. Yeah, I think it's, it's the connection that we have with the cosmos or that particular situation or time has with the cosmos. And if you rule out divination, I don't think astrology can actually 
exist in any manner. So, yeah. So that's my view of it, my own bias. <laughs> and so from that point of view, the question is, why should a chart give an answer? And in the divination literature, uh, the person has, the questioner has to be sincere. It has to be an honest, sincere question. So people who ask frivolous or trivial questions like, uh, you know, I don't know, I can't think of, there are a lot of people who ask hoary questions, which I think are not valid hoary questions, they're kind of stupid questions like, uh, what color will my new car be when I buy one? <laughs> It's a question, and you can do a chart and try to figure it out, but I wouldn't consider it a horror question. A well, horror question has to be something that really matters to you, that makes a difference in your life, and you need to know the answer, and you can't figure it out by yourself. So that's another stipulation that came in from Bon. Bonatti made that very clear in the Middle, the middle Ages, yeah, that he would act, bon, Guido Bonatti, the Italian astronomer, the horror astrologer. If someone came to him with a question, he would first ask, what have you done to figure it out yourself? And so well, nothing I'm asking you. He said, go back and try to figure it out. And if, if you can't figure it out and you still want to know and it's important to you, you come back and ask me. <laughs> and he would also tell them, you go pray. It's, you got to pray, pray for divine guidance. And if all, only if all that fails, are you allowed to ask me a horror question? So it's kind of a sacred, it has to be something that really matters to you. It can be relatively trivial from someone other else's point of view, but it has to really matter to you. And uh, the answer has to make some difference in your life. And you cannot figure it out on your own. You know, like, say you, you just told me now, I lost my keys on the way here. Where are they? I said, I would ask, where did you look? Well, I haven't looked yet. Well, I'm not going to do a chart because you haven't done anything to answer your own question. <laughs> uh, okay, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and my argument is we are, it's kind of a sacred ritual. We're asking the heavens, the universe, whatever we believe, the, the symbolic uh, spiritual dimension of the universe for guidance and help. We shouldn't do that lightly. <laughs> We should only do it if it matters, and if we haven't been able to figure it out ourselves, then we can ask the horror question. Uh, so, now there are theories about why the moment the astrologer understands the question becomes important. The theory I like is that you're asking me to, if I'm the astrologer and you're the client, you're asking me to help you figure something out that you can't figure out yourself. And you're inviting me to participate with you in doing this. So we're, we're entering a contract. It's kind of like a marriage, right? Okay. <laughs> Which is, and in Horay, the astrologer is the seventh house person. Huh. We have made an agreement. It's like we've gotten married around this issue. And we're going to, in our marriage, figure out what to do about it. Sure. And so that's why the moment the astrologer enters in, agrees, and understands what's going on becomes the moment of the horary question. Uh, now, Emma, in her book, interestingly, she takes a different approach. If I, and I don't want to misquote her, but as I understand what she says, the question really belongs to the queer, the person asking the question. Yeah. So you should really take the moment the question occurs to the person and the place where the person was. Uh -huh. so, so she kind of leaves the astrologer out of it from that sense. It's not a marriage of the two. It's more, you have this question, you're consulting me as an expert about your question. That's not the way I do it, but there are a number of people who do it that way. She certainly does and gets good results. So okay. that's the odd thing about this is that... Uh, what you believe really matters. Uh, and sure. so, you know, there's a, 
I think it's in Jeffrey Cornelius's book or maybe one of his lectures. I've heard a number of his lectures. He talks about a client who came to see him and he put up the birth chart and he studied the birth chart, the transits, the progressions and so on, and was very helpful to the client and later discovered he'd entered the data wrong and was using the wrong birth chart, but he gave the right answer. <laughs> okay. uh, and I've had a similar experience, which I was sort of, this happened to me years ago, a woman I didn't know called me. She was sort of desperate about something. It was late. I'd worked all day like you just did. And I put up the chart and I was tired and I must have punched in the wrong date. So I did this nice interpretation for her based on a wrong chart. She thought it was very helpful. So she called me a couple weeks later to tell me how helpful it was. But the next day I reviewed my work when I was more awake and realized everything I said was based on the wrong birth chart. <laughs> and then I had this ethical dilemma. Do I call her back and say, I'm sorry, you know, all, that, all the things I said that you thought were helpful were based on wrong information? I decided not to because I thought that would be too harmful. And it turned out the consultation was very helpful. The predictions I made did come to pass, interestingly, but they were based on the wrong data. And for years that bothered me until I read Jeffrey Cornelius and realized he had a similar experience. And his explanation, which made sense to me was, it wasn't really accidental that I punched in the wrong data, that somehow that was important to do and reading the wrong chart was the right thing to do because it gave the right information. <laughs> uh, again, divination. So this isn't really horary, but it's related to the idea of what makes astrology work. Yeah, sure. Because I think in horary, we're basically, it's divination. We're asking the heavens to help us with a problem that we can't solve. Sure. Um, so so uh, in, in terms of validity of a question or to find out the validity of a question, see, there, at, at times there could be a very serious question, but very serious question that is potentially life-changing to the native, but the question that comes uh, from the native might not be entirely uh, serious or something like that. So the tone of the question could not be serious. So how do you find that? Is it only based upon the ascendant degrees uh, when the rising sign is... What yeah. happens, rules developed, but is good on this. He says because he was a famous astrologer, people were consulting him all the time, but some people thought astrology was nonsense and would come to him to ridicule him or give him stupid questions to, sh to make him feel or look foolish. And so he looked at those charts and he said, if these things happen, the question may not be valid. If it's early ascendant, the late ascendant, and if the hour ruler doesn't jibe with the ascendant. But these are just rules and you can't really go by the rules. There are more guidelines. What's important is, at least in my experience and what I've come to see is, regardless of the rules, the chart must fit the situation. Okay. For example, with an early ascendant, which is one of the so considerations before early, like one or two degrees rising. Some astrologers say, it's too early, I can't read this chart. But Lily, Lily points out, uh, well, if it's very early in the situation, maybe the early ascendant is describing the situation. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, uh, maybe today on your way home, your phone rang, you got a new job offer. And you hadn't been expecting it, and you consult the astrologer and say, should I take this job offer seriously? Is it, will it lead anywhere? Okay. And you do the chart and there's one degree rising. Well, the one degree rising might simply be a symbol for the fact that you just heard this and it's very early. So it really fits your situation. Yeah, so you, I, I have my own personal example in this case. So yeah, please continue. <laughs> I'm sorry? No, uh, I have my own personal example where which just fits in with the one that you told right now. It was, uh, I had a job interview 
and uh, the employer had sent me an offer uh, and i just looked at the horary chart for that particular moment and uh, it was it was late rising not early rising but it was late rising almost in the final uh, decan of leo so and uh, the, the placements were not entirely uh, favorable the 8000 and stuff were not entirely favorable which were clearly indicating an immediate change so uh, and the offer they made were also not entirely uh, kind of uh, attractive that i could leave my current job and then move on so i kind of uh, left it and uh, i just tried to negotiate for uh, i mean the further more monetary revision or something like that but they refused to do it and i just turned down the offer so it was pretty much evident in the horary chart even though i kind of wanted that particular job at that particular point of time the horary chart kind of gave an entire picture of how things are going to turn mm-hmm. uh, uh, in the first place i didn't even uh, i didn't even think that i would go for a negotiation and then they would kind of reject it or something like that mm-hmm. but things turned out to be that way and this is the late rising yeah But see, I think you can't go by one factor. The whole chart has to describe the situation. And if it really fits, then that's a valid chart. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, you look at these guidelines and they make you wonder, but you can't take them too seriously. That's <laughs> yeah, guidelines are just guidelines. I've had this <laughs> discussion many times with many people. Yes, sure. So, I mean, maybe we should step back a bit because there may be some of your viewers who don't know what horror astrology is. Maybe we should just define it. Yeah, sure. I think, yeah, defining horror is a good place to right. start. So the idea of horror astrology is that a person has a pressing question that they've been unable to answer themselves and they consult an astrologer. And the astrologer does a chart for the question. It's really kind of the birth of the question people sometimes say. Uh, the idea being that the moment that the, the querent, the client or querent, we call it, say querent, the person who queries your questions, asks the question, the astrologer understands, becomes a sig- symbolically significant moment. It's the birth of the question. And theoretically then the chart should reflect what the question is about and how it will develop over time and how it re- will resolve itself. So I think that's how I would define it. Great. Other people might define it differently. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, there are some ast- astrological theoreticians who look at it this way, that If you believe astrology works, nothing we do happens in isolation from the heavens. <laughs> so the question, why is this question on your mind at this time? It must have something to do with your birth chart, the planets that are transiting your birth chart, the progressions of your birth chart. And the moment the question is pressing must have a cor- correlation with something going on in the heavens. And that's what the horary chart will pick up on. I don't know if I'm making sense to you. Yeah, for sure. Well, for example, let's, how do I share screens here? Um, stop it on mute. So let me try, let me just do this. Uh, okay. So let me sh- uh, then. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so what I did here was I put up a horror. This isn't really a horror. This is an event chart for the we were supposed to meet at 1:30 today. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I used Regia Montana's houses because Lily did. You can use other house systems. Sure. Um So this is actually a consultation chart. We had agreed to meet at 1.30. I think we started a little after that. Yeah. So it would push the house cusps a little further. But if we look at this, I always start with the day and the hour. It's a Venus day, it's a Friday. And this is here where I am. I did. I also looked at where you are, but I'll do where I am. 
and it's a sun hour. So we look at the chart. Venus is in the eighth house. It's dignified in Pisces. I'm using the uh, tropical zodiac here, not the sidereal. Um, so Venus is quite dignified and it's in the eighth house, which among other things has to do with occult subjects, esoteric subjects. Uh -huh. uh, I think in Vedic astrology, that's the case too with the eighth house, right? Yeah, sure, yeah. Eight houses apparently. And so we're talking about horror, divination, an esoteric subject. And the sun is the, it's, we're in a sun hour, the hour of the sun. The sun is in the ninth house, which has to do with people at a distance. You're in India, I'm in the United States. It has to do with astrology, the ninth house. It has to do with divination, uh, spirituality, religion, philosophy. So these are the things we're talking about. So it's very fitting. Yeah, sure. Uh, we have Leo rising, and the sun is in the ninth house. So, and we're talking about astrology and divination. It, it, so there's things going on in the heavens that, you know, and we didn't pick this time because of the chart. I didn't even look at the chart. We picked the time because it was when we could both meet. Yeah, and sun is an excellent, uh, it's in an excellent dignity, so. Yeah. Um, and so this I'm was gonna, not a very deliberately picked chart, yes. We, we just picked it based upon when we could do this. We picked it on when we could both get together, we both free. And now I'm looking at the chart to see what issues, well, the, you know, the ascendant is really important. It's Leo, the sun is in the ninth. We're talking about astrology. We're at a distance. You're in India. I'm here. Uh, there was just a new moon. The moon is now separating from the sun. So we're beginning a new phase here, the new phase of the moon. Usually the new moon is a time of starting a new project or sure. so the modern planet Uranus is up in the mid heaven here. It's in the 10th near the mid heaven. It's a modern symbol of astrology. The planets near the midheaven are extremely prominent in charts. Um, so, interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I never expected that you you'd pull up a horror chart for this discussion itself. <laughs> well, this is really an event or a consultation chart, but <clears throat> but I just did this to show how it's not random. We pick the time. We didn't look, we, neither of us looked at chart, neither of us looked at the ephemeris to see what was going on. Yeah. But the time matches what we're doing. <coughs> sure. Uh, okay, so let me go back to, I'm not sure how to unshow stop share, okay. Okay. So, it's done. But, so if, if that were a horary question, we would say it's a quote, radical chart. It's, it describes the situation. Oh. That's the point I was making. Sure. Uh, it wasn't a later early ascendant, but the chart actually described the situation very well. Symbolically, it fit exactly what we're doing. So if we had a horror question, we would expect that chart to give us a reasonably valid answer. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> I, I think that, that kind of establishes uh, what horror astrology is basically. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the history. So I think to get back to, I think the horror began with the consultation chart, and then astrologers began using. Someone had the idea of, let's do a chart for the time they asked the question, and that clearly is in Dorotheus who talks about the slave running away and says, the time you ask me the question is the time we should use. Yeah. Um, so that is a very important symbolic moment. And then astrologers after that took that idea and developed it. Uh, Hori was very, very popular among the Persian Arabic astrologers uh, in the 7th, 8th centuries. Yeah, it, it kind of flourished in the post-Hellenistic era where the, uh, at the end of, I think, Theophilus of Edessa, which was mm -hmm. translated recently by Benjamin Dykes and Eduardo Gramaglia was uh, it was more of military astrology that had to do with elections and horary. And then mm -hmm. I think the early medieval astrologers like Masha'Allah kind of 
laid more emphasis on the horary or interrogational astrology. So, right, and I'm assuming that information got transmitted to India because there was a lot of trade between Persian. I know the the whole theory of solar returns went to India about the seventh century from the Persians and the Arab uh, countries into India through trade routes. Mm -hmm. And the whole theory of, what do you call them? Solar Sub return. Uh, I can't think of the name. In okay, you mean the Indian subcontinent? To I India, yeah, and Vedic astrology, yeah. Okay. So I'm assuming that the Hori also made its way to India around the time that because there was so much information going back and forth between India and Persia about astrology. Uh, and then when astrology got to Europe, you know, entered through Spain with the Arabic invasions, uh, and the Arabic texts were translated into Latin in Spain and then made their way throughout Europe. Um, Hori became very popular, especially among the Italians. Um, they really, in the Ren Middle Ages and Renaissance, had translations of the works and used it quite extensively. And then that literature made it to England. Lily got, well, Lily had studied Latin and uh, could read in Latin, so he read the texts and I think wrote the first important book in English in Hori. Yeah, I like might have been others, yeah. uh, but he was yeah. really a master. He had really read the um, available texts. Well, a lot of stuff was not yet available. Fortunately, it's becoming available now through Ben Dykes and the translators. Yeah. So there's a lot of new and interesting information, but the core of it, I think, was there. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I think uh, we also wanted to discuss about the aspects that we might have to consider in horary astrology in terms of, yeah, of being positive or negative, but still there could be constructive or destructive as well. Okay, well, let me give a brief, really brief overview of how to approach a horary chart. <laughs> okay. Because um, we haven't done that yet. So the basic idea is someone asks a question, either you ask your own question or you ask an astrologer. You cast a chart for the moment the question is really clear in your mind and pressing, or when you see the astrologer and you both understand what you want to know. The person who asks the question is represented by the first, the ascendant and the first house. And so the planet that rules the ascendant is the the query, the person asking the question. And then you're asking about something. I want to know about, it could be money or children or marriage or trip. So you have to find, that's called the quesited in Lily's English. So the querent asks, the question is what they ask about. Uh, what they ask about will belong in one of the 12 houses of the horoscope. Ah, uh, yes, sure. Uh, and so you have to locate, this is probably the hardest part of Horary. You have to figure out what houses am I going to use? And yeah. <laughs> that is not easy because there's different traditions. And I know for instance, in Vedic astrology, the houses are a little different than in Western astrology. Uh, for example, you put vehicles in the fourth house in India, we put them in the third house in the West. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's differences like that. Um, some people put the mother in the fourth house, others put the mother in the 10th house. Okay. Uh, so, so, so you have to decide what house will represent what you're asking about. And then the basic idea is you look at the ruler of the ascendant who is the person asking the question, and the ruler of the house they're asking about, and you ask, how are those two rulers related to each other? Are they connected by an aspect or not? Or is there some other planet that maybe is connecting them through aspects to each one? Uh, or sometimes there's something called emplacement where, like say you ask about a job 
and the, the ruler of the ascendant is in the tenth house, so you're up there thinking about this job. But the ruler of the tenth house is in the first house, so the the job or the owner of the company you're applying for is in your first house. That's called emplacement, because you're interested in the tenth. The tenth is interested in you, and that can indicate that you will come together. If there's, if the planets are dignified, if there's, and uh, or if there are what are called receptions. Uh -huh. if, if one planet is in the a dignified place of the other planet, then they have usually have a good relationship going. Uh, and receptions were really big among the Persian Arabic astrologers. They, they kind of fell out. I think the literature just wasn't there. And it's coming back now where we really look at dignity of planets becomes much more important than we previous, I think we previously realized with the newer translations is what I'm saying. Um, but again, that's another area. I think John Frawley has a kind of, in my view, a very unique view of receptions that almost nobody else agrees with. <laughs> uh, so you can get really confused reading different people about how to interpret receptions. Uh, but anyway, um, do you have other questions? I'm sort of rambling here. <laughs> no, uh uh, I think you gave a, uh, I mean, a good idea of how to approach uh, horary chart. So, so is there a specific thing that is attached to moon? Because uh, moon, is, moon is a very important planet, especially in Vedic astrology. Uh, I mean, it, it's also very important in, uh, I mean, Western astrology it's also. So, uh, and in elections, we use... Uh, we make sure that moon is not uh, making any hard aspect with another planet. So yeah, yeah. No, the moon is is very very important. Um, let me summarize the moon. <laughs> the moon is thought to be important, uh, at least in Hellenistic. And I wish I knew more about Vedic astrology. Okay. I know the moon is very important. But the idea is. The moon and the sun are considered the two lights in the solar system. The sun generates the light, the moon reflects it, and they have the most light. And light is considered a spiritual force. And light is considered the means by which the influence of planets is translated from one to another. Um, and so the moon is closest to the earth. And the ancient Greek astrologers had this model of the heavenly spheres, the earth was in the center, and then the next sphere around the earth was the sphere of the moon. Uh -huh. Nothing could get to earth that didn't travel first through the sphere of the moon. So the moon influences or has some say over everything that gets from the outer universe to the earth. The light of the sun can't get to the earth without passing through the orb, the sphere of the moon. The light of Jupiter and Saturn can't get to the earth without passing through the sphere of the moon. So the, the earth itself was referred to as the sublunar world. And That's then interesting. Every, every celestial influence to use sort of the idea of cause and effect in physics had to pass through the sphere of the moon to get at the earth. So the moon was always coloring everything that came from outside the outer universe to the earth. So that you cannot experience any planet's influence or the, even the sun's influence without the moon having a say in how it gets to you. Uh -huh. In addition, the moon is the fastest body traveling around the earth. So it has to do symbolically, if it's constantly changing with everything that changes, it's a symbol of change. So sure. it's a symbol of cycles. And so in horary, since we're asking about 
how will things change over time, the moon is a major symbol. And because the moon is the sort of, it kind of gathers the light from the other planets and beams it down to Earth. It was kind of a relay station. Mm -hmm. um, nothing is going to happen on Earth that isn't first touched by the moon. And so it's, it's good to have the moon in a good state because you want to get happy beams coming down on you. <laughs> uh, if the moon is in a bad state, either in a bad dignity or, say, in square to Saturn or something like that, <clears throat> then anything that passes through the lunar sphere is going to be colored by that square to Saturn. It's going to be, bring difficulty along with it. Even if it's a good, say it's like it's trine from Jupiter, but there's also a square to Saturn. Yeah. The trine will still be good, but it's going to have a tinge of a Saturn square in it. So it's not going to be that good. It's going to have a little sting to it. Um, the moon is also a general symbol of development over time. And that's what Hori is asking. What will happen to this matter over time? So the course the moon takes from the moment of the question on forward is a general indicative of how will matters develop, all matters develop, related to this question over time. The past aspects of the moon show how matters have developed up to this time, what's been going on, and what is likely to go on. So that sort of gives you the background, the colors of the background. Uh, the moon also being very fast can do this thing that we call translation of light, meaning if it's just aspected one planet and it's about to aspect the next, say the moon has just left Mars and it's about to aspect Saturn, then it will, even though Mars and Saturn may not be an aspect, the moon will take the influence of Mars and transmit it to Saturn and that will influence the question. So the, and the, the moon, because it travels so fast, can be everywhere, is a symbol of things that move. Fugitives, lost objects, lost people, lost uh, pets. Lost it's, things are usually uh, associated with the moon and its position. Right. Because the moon is always moving about and pinpoint. Yeah, sure. So, You know, and then there is this consideration, the void of course moon. Void of course. Uh, the idea here is that if the moon is totally inactive, it's not within orb of any aspect to a planet. So it's just sitting there without interacting with another planet. It's called void of course. And if it's inactive, its sphere around the earth will be relatively inactive. <coughs> any celestial influence has to pass through that sphere. So it's sort of not much is going to happen because sure. it, there's no vibration going on. Mm -hmm. uh, you want an active moon for action to happen. Uh, now, well, I, I also have maybe be worthwhile. How much time do we have left? Uh, th there is no specific limitation on time as it is. Because I did pull out from my files a horror chart that I did for myself. I thought it might be useful to go through it so we're not sure. talking theoretically. Sure. Does that makes sense? So yeah, let yeah me, sure. Let me find that chart. Whoops, that's not it. Uh, give me a second to pull up the chart and then I'll share the screen. Uh, okay. And then I gotta, Share screen, share screen. Okay, I just shared the screen. Tell me when you can see the chart. Yeah, it's there. It's there, okay. So here's the, let me give the background. The question is, will we be able to go to Italy? Okay, th I think this was the one you wrote as an article. Uh, yeah, I just put this on um, my blog because I thought we might discuss it today if you want to read more about it. Yeah, sure, I, I, was, I was just about to ask this. Okay, so here's the background. 
I asked this question September 9th, of 20, a few months ago in September. Uh, I was in Massachusetts, I live in Connecticut, I was in Massachusetts at a wedding. <laughs> Okay. I asked the question. And here's the background. Earlier that week, uh, I had had a cardiac arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. And it was being evaluated. I was able to go to the wedding, but I was concerned that this cardiac arrhythmia would prevent me from going to Italy. My wife and I had been planning a vacation trip to Italy in October. And I wasn't sure if I'd be able to go or not, or if I had to cancel the trip. And being at the wedding, being away from home, and being a little bit symptomatic, I was getting more and more concerned. Like, you know, I have to cancel the trip fairly soon. I'll lose a lot of money if I don't do it, and so on. So it was a somewhat pressing question. I really wanted to go. I really didn't want to cancel this trip. Um, but I knew that I had a medical problem that had to be taken care of. And so the question is, will I or will I be able to go to Italy to take this trip or not? So if we look at, I always start with the day and the hour. It was a Sunday. We were at a wedding on a weekend during a moon hour. So I'm going to look at the sun and the moon in the chart. The sun is in the 11th house. The moon is at the end of the 10th house. And the moon is moving toward the sun. So it's about to be a new moon. Yeah. Um, now, when the moon is approaching the sun in horary, this is important to say in horary, not in general, but in horary, that's usually a bad sign because you can't see the moon. It's completely dark. Mm. And it, the, this condition is called combustion. Like the sun is so hot and so bright, it's totally overpowering the moon. I remember the moon we said was very important in horary, so that the moon is getting burnt up by the sun. It can't be seen. It's invisible. This is a bad sign in horary. Oh. Um, you know, it's the new moon hasn't happened yet. The moon is about to be completely blackened by the sun, and so in a way, this is a symbol of death and rebirth. The moon is in in the midst of dying here; hasn't been reborn again. So something is coming to an end. Uh, so th th right away, <laughs> that's not a great sign for going. Uh -huh. uh, in this chart, it's Scorpio rising. So I am represented by Mars. Mars is at the very end of Capricorn. 2944, it's got what, 16 minutes to go before it leaves its sign. So then there's this sense of something ending. Mars has been in Capricorn a long time. It's about to shift out of Capricorn, go into a new sign. So again, there's a sense of something is about to change. And when Mars, Mars is dignified in Capricorn, it's, it's exalted there. When it moves into Aquarius, it's going to lose that dignity. So it's going to go from a very dignified state to uh, leaving something and, and having less dignity. And it's also significant, Mars rules Aries, which is the sixth house, which is health issues. So Mars rules me as the ascendant, but it also rules my health issues, which I'm worried about. Um, it's about to be a change in my health issues for the worse, because not on, only am I about to lose my dignity in Capricorn, but when I enter Aquarius, I'm going to conjoin the south node of the moon. Mm -hmm which is generally considered not a good influence, a malefic influence, and often has health implications. I think the same is true in Vedic astrology. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because Mars relates to the body and health, the physical right. status. That could indicate a worsening of a health problem. The moon here rules the ninth house, which is travel. Mm -hmm. And the moon is about to conjoin the sun, and it's invisible. So that's not a good sign. Uh -huh. The moon is the moon connected to Mars, my ruler? No, there's no connection. Uh, and in fact, th this is called if 
if it were in orb, there would be an applying trine, but it's not in orb. The orb of the moon is about 12 degrees in Horary. Mm -hmm. So Mars is too far away for that to be an orb. And when the, for the moon to even approach the trine to Mars, it first has to conjoin with the sun. Has to be. Yeah. So the combustion of the moon is probably going to prevent it. Um, now, another thing to look at is, let's see, you, you always look at angular planets, I think, in any branch of astrology, because planets on or near angles are very, very powerful yeah. and will express themselves. There's really nothing close to the midheaven. Uh, Venus is relatively close, about five degrees from the ascendant, so that's probably important. Mm. Um, but... Venus is not dignified in Scorpio, and Venus rules the twelfth house, which is a house of misfortune. Yeah, sure. House of loss. Right. So the fact that Venus is powerful here, uh, but it has no dignity and is uh, the ruler of the house of the twelfth house of loss of some kind of giving up something, mm. uh, isn't it? And yeah, then, it's, it's an indication of the fact that you need to change your mind. Right. And that the closest planet to an angle is Uranus, the modern planet, which some horror astrologers don't use. They stick just the visible planets. Um, but I think they're important, so I put them in. This is the most angular planet. It's only three degrees away from the horizon. So far and away, Uranus is the most powerful planet in this chart. And that's a planet of disruptions, surprises, unexpected events. And it happens to be opposite Venus, which is also very powerful and rules the 12th house. Yeah. And Venus rules the seventh house. Uh. <laughs> which in, in some hoary, older hoary texts and older literature has to do with foreign travel as well as the night. I believe in Vedic astrology, it's also foreign travel, right? No, uh, it's uh, foreign travel is ninth house. Ninth, but I thought the seventh and twelfth also could refer to foreign Tw travel. Twelfth, twelfth is foreign land, and seventh is uh, seventh refers to travel, but not necessarily as long as uh, mm -hmm. ninth house. So may maybe a foreign trip from India to Sri Lanka would be uh, something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's very little positive in this chart indicating that I would go on this trip. And in fact, what happened was my condition got worse. I had more testing. I ended up needing surgery in November. And yeah. I just couldn't go. I couldn't have gone to India, the doctor actually, to um, Italy. Uh -huh. so, and the doctor actually told me not to. So I did have to cancel the trip. But I thought it was indicated in the chart that, um, okay. oh, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was super interesting. So did you kind of make a change in plan based upon this horary chart or you had to go upon the doctor's advice and your actual medical condition? I thought from the chart I probably would have to cancel the trip. But it wasn't until I had further testing and the doctor said you have to cancel the trip that I did. Oh, okay. I really didn't want to cancel the trip. <laughs> okay. What the chart was telling me, I thought, was you're probably going to have to cancel this trip. There's nothing really positive here showing you going to Italy. Okay. And in fact, what it seems to be showing is my health getting worse with the ruler of the first and sixth uh, applying to the south node. Mm -hmm. so, and in fact, my health did get worse and I did need surgery. Okay. So, uh, is there anything else? No. So I thought the chart was accurate. It showed the course of events, but the decision I made kind of independent of the chart because I really wanted to go. <laughs> really, yeah. I had to listen to the doctor, right? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so the other thing I'm looking here, the moon rules the ninth house of travel. 
-huh. And the moon is peregrine, meaning it has absolutely no essential dignity. That's important. The P is for peregrine, meaning no essential dignity. That's an important factor. When a planet has no dignity, it's not going to manifest in a very positive way. Um, right? It's and what else? Oh, the other planet I looked at was Jupiter, because Jupiter is in the first house. That's usually a good sign. But again, Jupiter is peregrine. It has no dignity. And uh, Jupiter rules the fifth, which can be vacations. That's why I looked at Jupiter. Okay. And Jupiter, as general, can have to do with travel over long distances. So I just couldn't find much positive in this chart. Uh, all right, so let me stop the sharing. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, that's sort of a typical Hori chart. It's not dramatic. It's not obvious. You have to really go into it. Um, but uh, I think it's a, a good example. Yeah, for sure. I think it was a good example. So the, the actually, uh, as this discussion was shaping in, shaping very well, I just wanted to ask you for that particular chart you posted as a blog article or something like that. Well, so, I, I did the blog because I knew we were talking. So I thought if people want to see this in detail. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, great. I think, okay, it was well pre-planned. Okay, cool. Um, you had asked when we first talked about the role of fate versus free will in horror. Ah, uh, I, think that, I think that can be a separate discussion altogether because it's a very uh, long topic. So uh, I just decided that it can be a specific uh, topic itself because because of the amount of discussion that we had today, which directly links to that particular topic, which is the fate oriented or free will oriented version of. I think story. this part is a good example of that though, because the chart indicates I probably will not be able to go to in Italy and probably my health will get worse, which it did. Yeah. Uh, I still could have chosen to go to Italy. I could have said to the doctor, I don't care what you tell me, I'm taking this trip. Probably would have, ha what would happen, I would have ended up in a hospital. Yeah. In Italy. So it, I did, still had the free will. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think the chart was saying it's not advisable and it looks like health problems are going to get worse in the not too distant future. And so, I had that in mind that the chart wasn't saying to me, go to Italy despite what the doctor says. <laughs> I wasn't going to take a chance with my heart to. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think I think you made the right decision. So, and I think I think we were supposed to have a discussion then, but since you had a, a bad health condition, I think we just had to postpone oh, yeah. until yeah, you. Yeah. Was the case. Yeah. yeah. So well, the other thing I could say, this just occurred to me now, in the symbolism of the chart, it was a Sunday during a moon hour. The moon ruled the ninth house. The sun is a general symbol for the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sun is a general symbol for the heart in Vedic so astrology as well. Yeah. The day of the sun, so the heart is, the symbol of the sun is ruling the whole day. At the hour of the moon, which happened to rule the ninth house of travel, I asked the question. Oh, so uh, yeah. I, I think there is a lot of divination attached to this. So uh, again, I think horary kind of ties back things to the nature or the cosmos in a very beautiful manner, and things manifest um, as it is already predefined or something. But whether it is pre predefined or we really still have our own free will left, I think we have to wait until our next discussion. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Anthony, for joining me. And uh, it was a very, uh, it was a wonderful discussion on horary astrology. I don't think I've ever had horary discussions with anyone as long as uh, I've had today. Oh, well, thank you. I've, I enjoyed it. It was very nice to meet you. Thank you so in much. Person, virtual person. <laughs> the virtual person, hopefully in person as well. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay. And I just want